Uh, we were discussing that uh, the Rambam Shita. Oh, I'll wait till it gets clear. Let's see. Yeah, uh, we were discussing the Rambam Shita about Eilam Haba, and uh, you'll remember that the Rambam Shita is that Eilam Haba is a totally spiritual world. There is nothing physical in Eilam Haba, and he bases this on a Gemara in Brachos. The Gemara in Brachos indeed says, Eilam Haba is ein bo achilu shtia. Eilam Haba does not have eating or drinking. It's sadikim yeshvim, the righteous people sit. Even that's metaphorical. Viatroseim barashehem, and their crowns are on their head. Vinanin miziv hashchina, and they get pleasure from the radiance of the divine presence. And the Rambam explains that the phrase atroseim barashehem. See, it's interesting. It, the, the, on one hand, the Pasuk is saying, uh, not the Pasuk, the Maimar Chazal is saying there is no physicality, but then it goes on and describes physicality. There is no eating, there is no drinking, but there's a crown on their head. So the Rambam says that also is metaphorical, and the crown refers to a person's intellectual capacity to connect to Hashem based on the Torah and the mitzvot that they've done in this lifetime. So atroseim barashayim is the das, the knowledge, the understanding that a person has, uh, which is nana miziv, miziv hashchina. Now, we'll come back to this because I want to go over today a machlokas rambam and ramban on some very fundamental questions. But before I could go over the Ramban, I need to briefly explain every term in the Rambam's lexicon based on the Hakdam of the Chelet. So we have this thing called Olam Haba. Olam Haba is where your neshama goes after you die, with maybe a stopover in Gehenna. Uh, but the Gehenna purifies you, it rectifies the Averos, and then you have this eternal connection to Olam Haba. According to the Rambam, Olam Haba is absolutely eternal, and that is the primary reward for mitzvahs, because everything that you get in this world, uh, in the nature of reward, is not really reward, but you'll remember it's only opportunity. Remember the Rambam explains that that which the Torah says, if you do mitzvahs, you'll get money or you'll get prosperity, that's so you'll do more mitzvahs and you'll get more Olam Olam Haba, right? That's the Rambam Shita, that there is no reward for mitzvahs in this world other than enhanced opportunities to do more mitzvahs. Now, we then have this idea called Mashiach. First of all, what does the word Mashiach mean? The word Mashiach doesn't have to be the Messiah. Mashiach literally means the anointed one. And in fact, the Torah uses the word Mashiach for people other than what we call the Mashiach. The Kohen Gadol is called Kohen HaMashiach, the anointed Kohen. Why? Because he is anointed with oil. When a person is appointed to be a Kohen Gadol, as well as a Melech, they are anointed with oil. So Mashiach just means the anointed one. It can be used to describe a Kohen Gadol. It can be used to describe any Melech, any one of the Malche, Malachim of Yehuda. Malchus based of it were Mashiach, Mashiach because they were uh, they were anointed. In fact, occasionally, the word Mashiach in Nach is even used to describe a non-Jew to whom Hashem gave a special mission and responsibility. Cyrus, Koresh, the king of Persia, who was a guy. In fact, he was an Oved of Odizara. He wasn't even a Maimon Bashem. But he was the one after the 70 years of the Babylonian exile and Persia conquered Babylonia. Koresh gave permission for the Jews to return to Eretz Israel and rebuild the Beis Hamikdash. He withdrew that permission and, all, and actually very few Jews went at that time. But in the Navi Yishayo, Koresh is described as the Mashiach, the anointed one of God. 
not because God spoke to Kairish. God did not speak to Kairish, but you no, know, Kairish, you know, Hashem gave him a destiny, meaning you, you didn't, you don't always know what you're, that you're being given a destiny, but HaKadosh Baruch was geyser that Kairish would be the vehicle to bring at least some of the Yidden back to Eretz Yisrael. In fact, it's interesting that uh, when the State of Israel was created in 1948, so um, the U.S. was not the first country to recognize. I think, I think the first country to recognize Israel was Stalinist Russia for some crazy reason. There must have been some cheshbon there. But uh, Harry Truman um, you know, was the president then, and he was one of the first to recognize the state of Israel. And this was Keneged, the recommendation of the State Department, which was anti-Semitic then and is kind of anti-Semitic now. So some things don't don't change because they feel that that would um, alienate the Arab the Arab world. Uh, but Harry Truman had been had been in business with a Jewish guy uh, years before. They they went bankrupt together. Eddie Jacobson, and Eddie Jacobson, you know, just told them you got to do this and whatever it is. So Truman recognized the state of Israel, and uh, some rabbis called him. You are the new Cyrus. You are the new Korish of our time because you are the non-Jew that God has designated to be the Mashiach, to bring the Jews back to Eretz Israel. So Truman knew his Bible, he knew his Old Testament, and uh, he really liked the fact that he was Cyrus, that really appealed to him. So for the next few years, when he was honored by all sorts of Jewish organizations and they would talk about how great he was and, and everything else, if they forgot to mention Cyrus, he would like pull the jacket of the speaker and say, you forgot to say, I'm Cyrus, you know. He really, really was in love with that particular, with that particular title. So the word Mashiach itself can mean anyone that is anointed and given a special mission by Hashem. But as we commonly use it, we use it for what we call the Messiah, which is nothing more than the word Mashiach itself. So what is Mashiach? So the Rambam says the following. I'm going with the Rambam. Again, I'll, I'll go over the Ramban after we go over the Rambam. Mashiach is there will be a person, so it's not just the Messianic age. There is a person who will be a descendant of David HaMelech. He will gather the exiles of Israel, the exiles of the Jewish people and bring them back to Eretz Yisrael if you're not already here, right? So, he, so Mashiach has certain jobs. Mekabetz, he will gather the dispersed of Am Yisrael. He will rebuild the Beis Hamikdash, the third Beis Hamikdash, which will never be destroyed. He will usher in a world of peace, which is a tremendous blessing. All of the nations of the world will accept Mashiach, not as their political leader. I mean, they'll still be United States, they'll still be England, they'll still be France, but they will look at the Mashiach as the spiritual leader of the generation. The nations will believe in Hashem, and they themselves will make pilgrimages to Yerushalayim to bring korbanos and to worship Hashem in the Beis HaMikdash. And uh, this is the goal, right? Mashiach is a tremendous thing uh, of Binyan Beis HaMikdash, Kibbutz Goliath, the reestablishment, the reestablishment of Malchus base David, the creation of peace in the world, and the whole world coming to an Amuna in Hashem Echad, Ushmo Echad. Before the coming of Mashiach will be a time of great cataclysm, great confusion. There will be wars. These are described in Tanakh, or not Tanakh, but in Nach, Nevi'im and Kesuvim, uh, they are described as the wars of Gog and Magog. Gog and, now again, Gog and Magog are actually not, uh, it's not Gog versus Magog. These are not the two sides of the war. Gog, actually, Gog is described, whoever Gog is, as the Melech of Magog. So Gog and Magog is Gog, the king of Magog. And uh, what is described in the book of Yechezkel is, he will gather many, many nations, many nations, which will make a confederacy to go against the Jewish people in Yerushalayim. And initially there'll be some success, but what will, what will eventually happen is that all of these nations were brought together. So Hashem will destroy those Rishayim and pave the way for the coming of Mashiach. 
Now, everything about the wars of Gog and Magog are shrouded in mystery. We don't know exactly what nations this is. We don't even know, and we hope, hopefully, if it already happened already, some connect Gog and Magog to the Holocaust, although it's not really clear because the Nazis never got to, to Eretz Israel. Some connect Gog and Magog to the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, there are some old traditions from the Vilna Gaon that it's connected to Russia. So Russia and the Ukraine may be connected. Again, it's hard to fit this into the Psukim. And there's even a Messiah from the Gra that the final war of Gog and Magog will be a 12-minute war. Now, nobody knew when, when the Vilna Gaon said this more than 200 years ago. Nobody understood what it means to have a war that's only 12 minutes. What type of war is only 12 minutes? Now, of course, we know uh, that a nuclear war can indeed be just a few minutes and kind of wipe out a lot of the world. So the Rambam says about the wars of Gog and Magog, he says it's Makubal. By the way, there are some other sources, interestingly enough, that talk about the war of Gog and Magog as being a plague, being a disease rather than a war. Well, we just have been through corona and, uh, and, and, and the like. The point is, there's a lot of different things that Gog and Magog could have been, or, God forbid, can become. We hope, we'd be much happier if Gog and Magog already happened. If it already happened, so we're kind of past that, and we're looking forward only to the Yemota Mashiach. If it didn't happen yet, uh, then that means there's some bad things that are going to be in store. In fact, one of the Amoraim once remarked, he prays for Mashiach, but he hopes he will be dead before Mashiach comes. He doesn't want to be alive when Mashiach comes because he would have to go through what are called Chavlei Mashiach, the birth pains of Mashiach. Right, you understand the analogy? Just as a woman, before she gives birth to life, goes through a lot of suffering, Chavle Mashiach, the birth pains of Mashiach, of which are the wars of Gog and Magog. Now, the one thing the Rambam says that's very instructive is, the Rambam says we should not spend time trying to identify the events that are happening whether they are Gog and Magog or not. You know, a lot of people like to do this. Christians are fascinated with this. Christians are always doing this. They're, they're comparing every battle and everything with, with, with this and that, both the Old Testament and the, the Christian Bible, the New Testament. You know, they, Christians do it a lot, and people in Eretz Yisrael do it a lot. Uh, there, there are a lot of websites, uh, Breslov and all these other people, this is Mashiach, and that is Mashiach, and that is Mashiach, you know, etc. And when, they, when, when, when this city in Ukraine gets invaded, that corresponds to this and that. And you'll notice, I mean, you look around, that uh, the two groups that um, are always involved in trying to correlate current events to the stages of Mashiach are Christian fundamentalists who love to do it, and, I don't know, Jewish fundamentalists, I don't know if they're whatever the term would be, but particularly the people in Eretz Israel love to get involved in messianic speculations. But what does the Rambam tell us about this? The Rambam tells us about this, that we should not get involved in trying to correlate current events with messianic speculation because we simply don't know. We don't have Nevi'im. We don't know if something is Gog and Magog. We believe in Mashiach, and we know there'll be difficulties. And when it comes, it comes. And the Rambam's language is that messianic speculations do not bring a person to Ava Sashem or Yira Sashem. So we shouldn't be trying to figure out when Mashiach comes or how this fits into Gog and Magog, although it can sometimes be very interesting. Indeed, different gematrias, you know, Trump is, I don't remember this stuff, Trump is gematria something and, and uh, whatever it is, and Clinton was gematria something else. The person who did it was Trump was the good gematria and Clinton was the bad gematria. Whatever it is, uh, you can play all of these different types of games in different ways. But the Rambam says, this does not bring you to Ava Sashem, and this does not bring you to Yira Sashem. So Bias HaMashiach, belief in Bias HaMashiach, should not 
get involved in messianic calculations, including Gogumagog. We will understand it in retrospect, meaning when the Mashiach comes, we will then be able to look backwards at every particular thing and say, ah, that's what that was, and this corresponds to Yechezkel, and this corresponds to Zechariah, and this corresponds to Yoel. These are three Nevi'im that talk about the wars of Gog and Magog. But these are things the Rambam says that you understand only in hindsight, but you don't understand uh, as it's happening, because you don't really know. Now, there is another piece of news, information, that's useful. That is, the Vilna Gaon writes, that the notion that the messianic era has to be preceded by wars and by death and by destruction and by disease called Chavle Mashiach, that's not inevitable. That is one way Mashiach comes. But through Torah and mitzvahs and zechrios, we can circumvent the Chavle Mashiach or even if we can't circumvent it legamre, we can minimize it. In other words, there is a certain, see, see Mashiach is inevitable. Mashiach will come whether we're Zohar or not. But if we're not Zohar, then it has to go through a very difficult, painful process. If we can be Zohar, then you don't need that difficult, painful process. And even if we're not Zohar legamre, to avoid all of the pain, because we've suffered a lot of pain, but we can stop it, we, we can stop it now. In other words, uh, we could basically say, okay, whatever we had, we had. Mikanul haba, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. So the Vilna Gaon says that Chavle Mashiach are not inevitable. Chavle Mashiach is part of a necessary process when we don't have the Zechuyos to bring Mashiach, right? So that's very important that there are ways of minimizing the wars of Gog and Magog. Yeah? Um, would that kind of explain why Corona was, at Baruch Hashem, like, so mild compared to other plagues? That like maybe the Torah learning protected us? And it, like, it, 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 yeah, I mean, it could, it could very well be. I mean, Corona uh, certainly had a, uh, well, when you say mild, <laughs> I mean, quite a few people did die, but, but more than the deaths of Corona, Corona imposed, partially because of the, the overreaction of, of the world, imposed tremendous, tremendous, tremendous economic costs. And those economic costs actually translated into suicides and deaths of unrelated re reasons, not because of corona. Heart attacks went up, uh, you know, people didn't get medical attention. So the truth is many, many people died, but again, uh, it could have been much, it could have been much, much worse. And it could very well be that Lima Datari, different Sukhuyas can mitigate, if not, if not exclude, but at least minimize the Chavle Mashiach. And that's an important thing, that the Chavle Mashiach, all of the, the worst things that the prophets describe don't have to be. They're the worst thing, meaning, hey, Hashem has to bring Mashiach. If we're not ready, then he has to throw us, throw us through all of these things till we're ready for Mashiach, but we can get ready in, in, in other ways. So, but, w but what is interesting is that the Rambam does make a point, both here and in the Mishnah Torah, that one should not get involved in messianic speculation. You believe Mashiach can come any day, but you don't try to figure out when he's going to come. And this is based on a Maimer Chazal. Tipach Rucham Shal Mechashvei Ketzim. Mechashvei Ketz are those who try to figure out the end of days. And Tipach Rucham means they're their spirit should explode. They ought to explode, meaning they ought to pop them like a balloon, meaning get rid of mechash mm -hmm. Now, this itself is a very, very interesting question because if any of you have ever learned uh, Sefer Daniel in particular, uh, Sefer Daniel actually does have a number of messianic calculations. In fact, I can tell you, I can't tell you when Mashiach comes, but I'll tell you a pas the Pasuk that tells you when Mashiach comes, the end of Daniel. Parakid Bays of Daniel tells me that from the day that the Korban Tamid was discontinued, you count 1290 and then 1335, and that is when the Geula will come. Problem is, what are you measuring from? What are you counting years, days, decades, centuries? Uh, and the Meforshim 
go crazy over it, over it all. Uh, but what's interesting is that Rav, Rav Sajagon, Rashi, Ramban, and even the Malvim who lived in the 19th century, the Malvim was not so long ago, they all try to use the calculations in Sefer Daniel to give you messianic dates. They're mechashvei hakates. They try to give you messianic dates. Of course, all of the dates they've come up with have already passed. So Rashi, typically, typically it's like 100 years further than you. So Rashi came up with, Rav Sajagon came up with a date. And by the time Rashi wrote, Rav Sajagon's date was passed, Rashi came up with a date. Ramban came up with a date. The last one of our Meforshim that tries to give you dates was the Malbum who came up with 1920 or whatever it is. But even the Rambam, in a letter, when the Rambam writes, we do not figure out when Mashiach comes. We don't do it. And he's very strong. Do not do messianic calculations. Right after he says that, he says, but you know, I wanted to give you a Messiah from my father about when prophecy will be returned to the Jewish people. And he gives you a date. And then he says, Mashiach will come shortly after. I mean, that's kind of an evasion, right? Now, I'm not calculating Mashiach. I'm just telling you when prophecy comes and Mashiach will come right after, after that. And he, try, he tries to give you a date. So it seems to be, I mean, again, I mean, on an emotional level, you understand what's going on. And we're not supposed to do this. But the yearning for Geula was so great. And the tsaras that Am Yisrael faced were so significant that even the Rishonim felt we got to give people some hope. We got to give people a sense that it's not so far off. So they didn't give it as a definite rule. They didn't say that this is it for sure. But the idea was that at least it's a hope. Now, of course, the problem is, you understand. Okay, very good. The problem is that giving dates that turn out not to be true is really a counterproductive exercise. Uh, now, there's a question would be, um, you know, you're in a very difficult state, so I want to give you hope. Don't worry, Mashiach will come tomorrow. Okay, well, what happens if tomorrow Mashiach doesn't come? I mean, maybe it's better to just tell people we don't know when Mashiach will come. We hope and we pray. Right, so, so to justify giving dates because it gives people hope is, is even psychologically not necessarily the best strategy. Uh, for that type of type of situation, but this is the issue of chishuf hakates, and even when Daniel was given calculations, Daniel was given calculations. He was told write it in an obscure way so that people won't understand it. So he was given, but he was told to obscure it in in many many different ways. Okay, so we're not gonna. This is a long way of saying that we're not gonna do messianic calculations. You can check different websites and see what they come up with uh, in, different, in different ways. Jewish and Christian, right? So sometimes they say the same thing, uh, whatever, whatever it, it would be. But here is the other point the Rambam makes. The Rambam says, what will life be like when Mashiach comes? Right? What is the life of Mashiach? So the Rambam says, first of all, Mashiach, Yemosa Mashiach, is not necessarily resurrection of the dead. That's gonna come later, so that's an important point. So we're not talking about resurrection of the dead. We're not. And the Rambam says something that might disappoint you at first glance. And the Rambam says, Yimosa Mashiach, Eilam Kemin Hagai Nayek. The world will go on in a normal way. A normal way. That means, people who work will have to have a job. We'll still be waiting for the buses. Uh, the buses will be more crowded, actually, because there'll be more people, Bezra Hashem, in Eretz Yisrael. People will still die, because you don't have to hear and people may still get sick, although the Rambam says that there'll be a general blessing in Yemos Mashiach. People will be healthier and the like, but there'll still be death and illness. There may still be some poverty, 
Although everything, in other words, everything will be better, but it'll be better in a naturalistic way. So the poor won't be so poor. The sick won't be so sick. People will live a long time. In other words, good stuff. But it'll be within the bounds of natural existence. In other words, the Rambam's point is, the Messianic era is not supernatural. Moshiach will die. And Moshiach will be succeeded by his son, son of Moshiach. In other words, it'll be a hereditary dynasty of Malchus based of it. Again, the Rambam is sharply differentiating Tchiyas HaMesim from Yemos Mashiach. We'll get to what Tchiyas HaMesim is going to be. So, what's so good about Mashiach, right? If I have to, uh, I still have to work and, uh, and uh, I'm still going to die, uh, I'm not necessarily going to be super wealthy. The answer is, Mashiach is about kibbutz Goliath, about living in Eretz Yisrael, it's about having a base Amikdash, it's about having Navua, which is wonderful, it's about world peace, and it's about a whole world acknowledging Hashem and the holiness of the Jewish people. So there's plenty of good stuff in Mashiach, even though it's not going to be a supernatural existence. And the Rambam says, once again, with his metaphorical bent, that when the Navi says, the lamb will lie next to the lion, or next to the wolf, and the wolf will not attack the lamb, that does not mean animals aren't going to fight. Animal, you know, wolves, wolves will eat what wolves eat. Lions will eat what lions eat. But it's simply a metaphor that hostile nations will not wage war. As the Pusik says, this is actually the motto of the UN, a Pusik in Yeshayo, Lo, it's also a niggin. Lo yisa goyo goy cherev. One na right, it's also a niggin. A, uh, one nation will not lift up its sword against another nation. Lo yilmadu od milchama. They will no longer learn war. And it says they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. You know, famous, famous Pasuk. Even non-Jews often quote this Pasuk. And this is the messianic vision of shalom in the world. But it's important to know that the Shitas HaRambam is, it is not a miraculous existence. It is not a supernatural existence. It is a blessed state. So what is the purpose of that? Meaning it's not the forum in which Hashem rewards you for your mitzvahs. The forum in which you get reward for your mitzvahs is the eternal reward of Olam Haba. Olam Haba. The schar for your mitzvahs is Olam Haba. Mashiach is not there to give you reward for your mitzvahs. So what is the purpose of Mashiach? So the Rambam says, the purpose of Mashiach is to create an environment where it's easier to do mitzvahs and God is giving me an ability to get more olam haba. I'm, in other words, by creating an environment where there's peace, where there's tranquility, where there's a base on mikdash, where the Jews are in Eretz Yisrael. It's easier for us to serve him. And if it's easier for us to serve him, what is the purpose of Mashiach? Kidei shaniska l'chaye olam Haba. So, according to the Rambam, Mashiach is not the end all of things. Mashiach is a means to be marbe archaye olam haba. So, based on that, I have two questions, which I don't have a clear answer for, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the questions. Question one is, we have heard numerous times both based on Chazal and all the Musr Svarim, etc. Right? Chazal say, Lefum Sara Agra. According to the pain is the reward. A mitzvah that you do with struggle, a mitzvah that you do with hardship, is much more treasured and valued by Hashem than a mitzvah that you do that's easy. So here is the thing. The Rambam is saying, Hashem is going to bring Mashiach and Geula to Am Yisrael and the world, so that we should be Zaycha and Eilam Haba by making mitzvahs easier for us to do. 
Isn't it the opposite? If the goal is to have the greatest olam haba, then, you know, we ought to be in gullus forever and ever and ever because then we struggle and we work and it's hard. In other words, why, why is the Rambam assuming you'll be zocha to more olam haba in an environment where mitzvahs are easier to do? Isn't there a problem the other way around? Lefum tzara agra. That, that's one question. I have a partial answer for that. But let me ask you another question. There's something here that, that doesn't compute. Because not everybody is going to be alive when Mashiach comes. Remember, Zechiyah Samesim didn't happen yet. So you say, Hashem is going to bring Mashiach so that we can increase our share in Olam Haba. Who's the we? We, by doing mitzvahs when it's easier, will increase our own. The we is only a small percentage of humanity, of the Jewish people. The we is not going to embrace the many, many centuries of Jews who died before Mashiach. So what are they going to get to increase their olam haba? I mean, how can you talk about Hashem will bring Mashiach so that you can merit more olam haba? Why you? Why only you? What about your grandparents? What about your great-grandparents? Is the idea, unless you're going to go with the idea, that the mitzvahs we do will also be a zechus for the prior generations? That, that is a possibility. That might be an answer as well. So these are two things to think about in the Rambam's formulation of the tachlis of Yemos Mashiach. But you see the, the chiddush here. The Rambam's point is, Yemos Mashiach is not the reward for your mitzvahs. Yemosa Mashiach is a gift that Hashem brings you so that you can do more mitzvahs, similar to what he said about Olam Hazad generally, that you can do more mitzvahs and be zaycha to Olam Haba, and it is Olam Haba, which is eternal, that is the ultimate reward for all of your mitzvahs, and that's based on your Deveikos Bashem, and uh, the more mitzvahs and Torah you've learned, the more you've perfected your neshama, the more your neshama is able to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Yeah? Um, can the Rav explain the last question? <coughs> the last question? The yeah, the first question is this. Uh, the Rambam says, oh, you know what God's going to do? God's going to create a world where it's so much easier to do mitzvahs. So you'll do more mitzvahs and you'll get more olam haba. So my question is, if the reward for a mitzvah is connected to the tsar and the difficulty, then fakert, maybe I would get more olam haba. By d it's hard to compute. Maybe less mitzvahs with tsar might turn out to be more olam haba than more mitzvahs without tsar. I don't know. Meaning, it's not necessarily the case that making it easier for me to do mitzvahs is going to give me more olam haba. Now, let me give you a partial answer to that. It could very well be that in Olam Haba, the main reward we're going to get is because of the mitzvahs that we struggled with. Meaning, it could very well be that the stuff that we're going to do Limos Mashiach is not going to give us more reward. I mean, we'll get some reward because it's still a mitzvah, but the Iker reward is the struggle. But, but here is the thing. You can look at Yemot Mashiach as a way of purifying ourselves so we can get the reward. In other words, the example would be, I mean, let, let me give you a simple example. Let me give you a, for some reason, I'm thinking about a, a, a collegiate example. Let's imagine that you had a kid who really wanted to be a doctor. He wanted to go to medical school. And he came from a poor family. He could not afford uh, any type of education. He had to work from the time he was eight years old. But he worked and he struggled and he demonstrated such discipline and such commitment that by the time he's 20 years old, the medical school committee is so amazed with him and they want to let him into medical school. They say, such a person will be a wonderful doctor. But the problem is, the guy's ignorant. The guy doesn't know anything. The guy doesn't, has no scientific background. He has no educational background at all. So we have to give him remediation in terms of teaching him biology, teaching him chemistry. But that's not why He's going to be admitted. He's going to be admitted to medical school because of his struggles, but he can't get in until he has the requisite knowledge. Mashiach might be the same way. 
your entitlement to Eilam Haba comes from your struggles. But Lamaisa, you still need a critical mass of Torah and mitzvahs to get in. And if your struggles, you did something but you didn't do enough, Yemot Mashiach will allow you to get the remediation, the remedial education, so to speak. So you'll get to Olam Abba. So your, your entitlement to Sechar is because of what you did before Mashiach. But you purify your neshama to be able to receive that schar by virtue of what you do later. So that's an answer to the first question. The second question, though, that how does that work for other generations? I think that's still a good question, unless you say, as I said, that what that last generation does will be a zechus for those earlier generations. Okay, so understand the idea. People will die, meaning a person, a, a person might die the day before Mashiach comes. And a person might die the day after Mashiach comes. So his experience of the Messianic era might be one day. Right? Be a, be a kind of a, a strange emotion for a family. Uh, you know, we, you know, we lost our father the day Mashiach comes. Right? So the day Mashiach came into the world is our father's yard set. Again, a little, little strange, but okay. That's, 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 life is that way sometimes. A person uh, can lose someone on Purim or, or whatever, whatever, whatever it would be. But the point is, Mashiach is not the end all. The end all, according to the Rambam, is Olam Haba which is the world of the spirit. This, by the way, is consistent with the Rambam's general shita of de-emphasizing the body. And this is part of a much larger... And the Rambam could not imagine that the guf, anything to do with the body, would be the ultimate way of connecting to Hashem. The neshama is a spiritual essence. And, you know, why would there be a guf in Olam Haba? And why would Yemosha Mashiach be the, the place that involves the guf still? So therefore the Rambam kind of disengages the guf from the neshama and posits the ultimate reward is Eilam Abba. So the last thing, which of course I'll elaborate tomorrow, is Tchiyas HaMesim. Now Tchiyas HaMesim again, once again, the Shittas Rambam is, this will not occur as soon as Mashiach comes. Mashiach per se does not inaugurate Tchiyas HaMesim. But at some point, there will be a physical resurrection. That actually means the soul will be taken from Olam Haba and put back into a body. Now remember, uh, people always ask the question, if you have been reincarnated many times, which body? Okay, we'll talk about that, but if you, if you would ask the Rambam that question, he wouldn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, the Rambam Bechlal does not go with reincarnation, so uh, you can't ask that question on the Rambam because he does not follow that sheet at all. It'll be reunited with your body. And the Rambam makes two points about Tchiyas and Both of them are uh, Chiddush, actually, and both of them are, uh, are Machloksim. They're not, they're not universally agreed. Point number one is that Olam Haba is available for tzaddikim and rishayim. Unless you forfeit Olam Abba. Meaning, what do I mean by that? Even if a person did many, many Averos, if he did some mitzvos, after his Gehenim, he will get Olam Abba. So even if a person overall is a Rasha, he will still get Olam Abba. Although we will discuss, there are ways you could forfeit Olam Abba. Masha'en kein techiyas hamesim, the Rambam says, is only for the righteous and not for the rishayim. So, a rasha might wind up getting some olam haba, but a rasha will not have techiyas hamesim. Now, that's very interesting. So when we make a statement, a rasha will not have techiyas hamesim, according to the Rambam, that's not as bad as it sounds necessarily. That doesn't mean obliteration. That just means there won't be Tchiyas HaMesim, but there's Olam Haba. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two, though, is really very radical. The Rambam says Tchiyas HaMesim itself is a temporary, one-time phenomenon. At some indeterminate point after Mashiach comes, we don't know when, Hashem will 
it's kind of a way of allowing the righteous, the way you could understand it, that this actually may be an answer to my second question, right? I asked the second question that if the purpose of Yemot Mashiach is to perfect myself by doing more mitzvos, how does that help the prior generations? Answer? That is what Tchiyas HaMesim does. They come back and they get to do mitzvahs and then they die and they go to Olam Haba. So actually, now, now that I'm thinking out loud, it actually fits quite logically. If the tachlis of, and this is mamish, I think the answer to my second question, and that is, uh, how are you benefiting the prior generations by creating a greater opportunity to do mitzvahs? The Rambam learns that's the function of Tchiyas HaMesim, but that's a gift Hashem only gives to the tzaddikim. Which means, once again, there's a consistent theme that is running through everything in the Rambam. And that is, the only eternal reward is Olam Haba, the world of the Neshama. Yemos HaMashiach is a mechanism that we could be Zoha to Olam Haba by doing more mitzvahs. And Tchiyas HaMesim is a way, I think, I think this is Taka of Gugan answer, is the way that the prior generations get a chance to be Zoha to Olam Haba, more, more Olam Haba, more Olam Haba, a deeper Olam Haba, meaning they're taken, you see, they're already in Olam Haba. They're taken from Olam Haba, they're put into a body. God says to them, you got 70 years to do more stuff. And after the 70 years, they then go back to Olam Haba, and that's where they remain forever and ever and ever, based on the higher madrega they achieved. So techiyas, so you both Yemos HaMashiach and Tchiyas HaMesim are simply means to enhance the depth and intensity of our Olam Haba. This is the very, very interesting shita of the Rambam, that even Tchiyas HaMesim is not eternal. But they'll have a long life. They'll have a long life, and uh, it's a gift that Hashem gives to the gives to the sadikim. So, this I think is not the way most people. Well, I know, I know most rishonim do not understand it. Most rishonim understand that the chiyas hamesim means the end of death. The end of death. They, they consider resurrection to be the end of misa. In fact, according to the Rambam, there is no end of misa. Physical death will never stop. In fact, one could even ask, according to the Rambam, how long is the world supposed to exist? Meaning, theoretically, Yemosa Mashiach, Mashiach will come by the year 6,000. Yes, okay. But how long will Yemosa Mashiach be? It's a difficult question, but theoretically, it could last forever. Meaning, new generations will be born, they will die, they'll go to Olam Haba, etc. Uh, of course, then you have another question. In other words, this is, let me ask you, ask you a third question, which is the opposite of my second question. My second question was, those generations that died before Mashiach, what will their zechus be? And the answer is, they'll come back to Chiyas HaMesim. But my question is, what about the new generations that are born after Mashiach comes? Right? So, uh, putting aside Gilgal, which the Rambam doesn't go with. In other words, you were born after Mashiach comes. So you were born into a world where you never had to struggle. So there I think you have a conceptual question. Like, I don't, it's like almost, it's almost a disadvantage. I, I don't have the zechus to do mitzvahs with struggle. So how much will my olam haba be? In other words, Bishlama, the people who are alive when Mashiach comes. So as I said, they will get their reward based on their struggle. And the Mashiach will be a purification time to make them worthy, like the medical student who has to take biology to get to medical school. But I have a problem with the generations that are born after Mashiach comes. They can be, that can be for 10,000 years. They never had struggles. So how great is their Olam Haba going to be? I don't know. 
Now, if you go with Gilgal, you could say, though, anyone born is a Gilgal. But, yeah, but, but if you don't accept the idea of reincarnation, you're going to have a, a problem with those new generations, at least. Yeah. You say that for these new generations, since there'll be such a revelation of Hashem, they'll have a much greater chance of being Sadiq and Gemur compared to... Right. Which that's that, that, that's that's certainly that's certainly very true. But the question becomes, they don't have the zechus of lefum tsara agra. According to the pain is the reward, because they don't have difficulty. So what do you do without difficulty? So the problem basically is that there must always be some difficulty. Meaning to say, when Hashem's presence is more manifest, I'm not struggling. Should I eat tray or eat kosher? But there'll always be a higher madrega in which you're struggling. In other words, it won't be between bad and good, but there will still be a nisayan between good and better, or between better and best. Meaning, there will be that nakuda of struggle that will still exist. Yeah. Oh, that was going to be my question. Like, you know, they're not going to. They're going to have some struggle. Just are, will, will, will they not still have struggle? Just the struggle will be like. You know, am I going to like bring my korban with the best kavana, or am I just going to be like, ah, here you go. Right. So I guess we have to assume that type of, of, of calibration, that struggles can manifest itself at different levels. Right? We talked about this when we when we're learning about free will. We have Dessler's idea of nekuda sabachira, that throughout life, even even forget about Mashiach, even in our regular lives, our struggles change. They become different types of struggles. So when a person first becomes uh, observant, a person becomes from, so you might be struggling not to, you know, drive your car on Shabbos. Now, right now, if you're a Shomer Shabbos, that's not a struggle. I'm not struggling, I want to drive my car, but I have a different type of struggle. How much kavana will I have? How much will I learn on Shabbos? So as you get to a higher and higher level, it's not that the struggles go away, but they manifest themselves in different ways. And your sakhar is going to still be with that struggle. Yeah. Um, if, if this all kind of, if like the whole, the whole idea of Gaul is connects to the fate of Adam and Chava, so then wouldn't it make sense for the world to revert as close as possible to the state that they were in before the fate? Like, like where does God need to do all this? Yeah, so according to the Rambam, the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, the common idea, a commonly expressed idea, that the Yemosha Mashiach is uh, bringing the world back to Adam Arish and Kaidam Achet. That does not fit the Rambam. That, that is really from the Derech Hashem, and, and that'll be based on the Ramban's opinion, which I'll talk about. According to the Rambam, there actually is no particular stage on earth where the, the world is Masukin back to that Madrega. Mashiach is a much better world, to be sure. But it's still not the same as other Marisha and Kaida Machet. So the familiar idea that, that you're talking about is based on a different conception of Techia Samesim, that that's the end of death and that's going 360 degrees. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in tomorrow. Okay, uh, yeah. I got stuck on the point that they're upset about how this, there are going to be in America and in France and everything. Are, yeah. these, are the, I mean, the Torses are 70 nations. Are they going to. Uh, uh, yeah, in other words, are, are they gonna are they gonna reconfigure in that particular way? I, I don't really know. Uh, that's an interesting point. Uh, meaning, uh, obviously, the modern nations are composites of different ethnic groups that were the seventy nations of the Torah, and they combined in different ways. So, in any given country, you have mixtures of these different uh, nations. Uh, are they going to be, so to speak? purified and separated or you know whatever nations they have is what they have and you know we don't really need them to be we, you know we don't need to have those particular groups i don't know this is a good question let me think about it a little bit uh yeah um, why would it be uh if the sadikim would be the ones bring back bring back from uh, from the team yeah how would that be a reward if if Alamaba is like Right. So the answer is because they're given a chance to do even more. I mean, you're exactly right. Meaning, uh, Itzadik is already in Olam Haba and Itzadik has a very high level of Olam Haba. But Hashem is saying, I'm going to give you a chance to even make your Olam Haba greater by giving you some years where you can do more and more mitzvahs. That's exactly the greatest reward. Itzadik is given more time 
a second chance, an extra chance, and the tzaddik will use that chance. But the Rambam Shita is, that's the gift Hashem gives to the already righteous. Uh, the truth is, the Russia needs it more. <laughs> the Russia didn't deserve it. So the Rambam says he's not going to get it. Yeah. Um, so at that time when it will be Mechimetim, they'll die again. That's correct. They will die again. That, that's, the, that's the Rambam Shita. Meaning it's as if, according to the Rambam, what Tichiyas HaMesim is, Hashem takes the soul of the righteous out of Olam Maba and says, hey, I'm going to put you back into a body during the Messianic era, and I'm going to give you 70 years to do more and more mitzvos, so that when you finally go to your final Olam Abba stage, it'll be a much higher level. Again, this is so unusual that, you know, it's so different than the way we think about it. We think, and again, that's the Ramban Shita, the Derech Hashem Shita, we think of Techiyah Samesim as the end of death. According to the Rambam, again, most Rishayim do say that. According to the Rambam, it is not the end of death. It is simply a mechanism for tzaddikim to be zocha to more olam haba by being given an extra chance to do mitzvahs and maizim taifim. Okay, so these are the three terms. Uh, we have olam haba, we have yimos mashiach we have techiyas hamesim, and hopefully you, 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 you know how the Rambam defines those terms. Uh, tomorrow I'll continue with Tchiyas a little bit, but I want to introduce you to the Ramban's view. Uh, the Ramban, of course, was also a Makubal. The Ramban was a great uh, student of Kabbalah, a great master of Kabbalah. And uh, the Ramban's views filtered down to Sifrei Kabbalah, like Derech Hashem, Ramchal, and the like. And in fact, the truth of the matter is, uh, in many, many ways, uh, it is the Ramban Shita that became the more common understanding of Tchiyas Samesim than the Rambam. The Rambam is really a big Chiddush. In fact, the Rambam himself got in trouble. Some people accused, because of the Rambam's definition of Tchiyas Samesim, some people accused the Rambam of being an Apikoris. They said, you don't believe in Tchiyas Samesim as, as we define it. Meaning to say, uh, the way you define Tchiyas Samesim is not Tchiyas Samesim, and therefore you don't believe in Tchiyas Samesim. <laughs> and the Rabbim had to write a defense. I do believe in it, but I define it a certain way. Right? You can't. Say, right? But again, it's a kind of a funny thing because the way they define Tchiyas Samesim, the Rambam is a cover. The Rambam is denying the permanent resurrection of the dead based on his definition. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, the Rambam does not say that. Uh, again, there is a Gemara that says the Yisrael will be shechted. The question is, what does that mean exactly? Meaning, uh, because if it means there is literally no Yetzir Hara, then you're back to square one. How, is the, how am I going to get more reward if there's no Yetzir Hara for doing a mitzvah? So the simple understanding, once again, is, uh, is shechted just means it's going to be diminished. I'm not going to have the taiva for bad. But I'm still going to have to struggle with good and better. And, and yeah, those that things. explains, like we ever said, how the how the war, because there would be some stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll 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 go over it. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Uh,